that the first time. Everybody, feel free to jump on up, join us in worship. Mm-hmm. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come over us come rest on us come rest on us and come down spirit when you move and make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will feel me come down spirit when you move and make my heart pound when you fill the room
happy Sunday, y'all. How's everyone feeling? We feeling all right? I know it's rainy. It's one of those days, y'all. Well, we're so glad you guys are here joining us. We're glad you guys are here in person. Everybody join us online. We're so glad you guys made it this Sunday. Um, yeah, we're, we're just glad you guys are here. Uh, make sure if you're, if you're online already, feel free to check us out. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. Um, and if you need information uh, as far as tithing goes, stuff like that, you can follow links online or just text 84321. Um, just a reminder for everyone that's here, I know you all know, but the, the nursery across the hall is open. Um, so if you have kids, want to drop them over there, feel free. Um, and also, on that topic, they're always looking for volunteers over there. So if you guys want to help out, feel called to, called to serve, uh, feel free to stop over there and let them know you guys want to help out. Um, yeah. Make sure, I think this is our second to last week of, of this series. Uh, so make sure you grab a, a bulletin out front if you haven't got one already. Um, it's got the, the list of everything we're going to be hitting for the rest of this month, as well as a little little spot there for, for prayer requests. You can just tear that off and drop it in the offering tray. So yeah, that about covers it. Uh, also, we got a special announcement. I know next weekend is the fifth Sunday meal. So fifth Sunday, I heard it's spooky food. Whatever that means. Sometimes Mexican's pretty spooky. I'm just saying. All right. On that note, back to worship. Let's go. Pouring me 
was awesome. Quentin Fryman was born in 1987 to his mother, Darlene Fryman, and his father, Kenneth Fryman. He was a devoted father to two little girls, Finley and Sailor. He was a devoted husband to Morgan. He enjoyed hunting and fishing, playing golf, and hanging out with his church friends. He died in June of 2003. From that point, the only thing that mattered was that he was a follower of Jesus. And it's really weird reading a eulogy of myself while standing up here. But I ask you, who are you? Who are you? This is the time that we take every week to be able to understand who you are. If you are a follower of Christ, it starts at the death of you. It starts at the cross. From that, you pick up your cross and you follow. It means you're not perfect in every single way, but it means that from that day, you died. You died to sin, you died to your old self, and from that point on, your number one priority was to follow Jesus. But in order to do that, you had to die. You had to take all sins, all transgressions, all the things that made you who you are and nail them to the cross. That's why this part of our service is so important because that's our realization that in order for us to follow Christ the way that we are called to do, we have to die. grapes turn into blood, the bread turns into the body, and we sacrifice. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you so much for showing us the way to you, the way to a better life, a better feeling, to be able to live and live abundantly by following your Son. But through that, we have to die to ourselves. We thank you so much for your son who came here and died for us. We thank you for all the lessons that he's taught us. And we thank you for the opportunity to just dwell in your spirit. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah. 
quivered the fire I'll provide the sacrifice Heavenly Father Thank you so much for this time to be with you this morning So we can worship and praise your holy name Once again let these words not be be just songs that we sing But words we live by Fill us up, fill us up, fill us up and let us know that in order to, to fill us up with your, your guidance, your love, your Holy Spirit, that we have to empty out what we've been carrying, what we've been dragging along, so that we can just pour it in, pour it in, more of you. Every day, all day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every day, all day. Like you into that, so gangster. Just saying, just saying. <laughs> What's up, guys? Happy Sunday. It's really quiet. I don't know what to do with this. When you sit behind a drum set and you're hitting stuff as hard as you can, then you get up and you say, What's up? and nobody says a word. It's a bit jarring. I just want to throw that out there to you. So, um, so. It's rainy, it's October, it's starting to get a little cold, it's um, uh, the end of fall break for some, I hope everybody had a good fall break, did everybody have a good fall break? Did anybody not have a good fall break? I'll pray with you. Who, was, who said me? Oh, poor Nate. Paige, that's on you. Anyways, um, so I hope everyone had a good fall break. It's October, it's starting to get cold, uh, it's time to get our flannels out. I celebrated by getting the flannel out uh, today, and it also means that it's chili season, right? It's chili season. You know what I'm talking about, chili season, when you make a pot, and then you have to stretch it out for like three days, right? And at the end, it's just a little bit of chili and a lot of peanut butter sandwich. Is that what it is? Yeah, I love chili season. And speaking of chili, next week is fifth Sunday. It's our fifth Sunday meal. And it's going to be a chili cook-off. So if you have the guts to enter your pot of chili into the chili cook-off, I will tell you whether it's the best or whether it's terrible. If it's terrible, I won't tell you. But if it's the best, I will tell you, okay? So if I don't say anything to you guys about your chili, you can just assume. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but um, so, so make a good pot of chili and bring it. And if you don't, bring a spooky side dish. I don't know what that means. I don't know if you have like little uh, finger sandwiches that are actually shaped like fingers. I don't know. That's spooky. That's a little weird. Paint your grapes up like eyeballs or something. I don't know what that means, but bring it. Let's see who's the most creative. I'm probably just going to bring the same thing I always bring, which is those little uh, pre-made chocolate eclairs. (laughs) Nobody bring those. I call dibs. So bring a spooky side dish. Okay, so we are in the fourth week of a series on fear, All right? Anybody afraid of anything? Okay, some of us are afraid of some things. Okay, I get it. Not the childish scary things, but the real scary things. I'm talking about the things that we worry about, the things that we kind of fret over. In week one, we talked about um, the darkness and, and, and the light's ability to overcome the darkness, right? About the fact that um, the light came to expose all the things that are dark. And, and whenever everything that's in the dark is exposed, you don't, you're not at risk of stepping on a Lego or stubbing your toe on the coffee table, right? Week two, we talked about, um, we talked about people and, and how jacked up they are, right? Would everybody agree with me? Can I get an amen on how jacked up people are? Can I get a Hallelujah. Can I get a boom shakalaka? Okay. All right. Um, But we were also challenged to be more like the Good Samaritan, right? Not one of the people that are scary, but one of the people that are willing to stop and at our expense as the church to help, right? And not only at our expense uh, as a church to help, but to have a good enough reputation that we can say to the owner of of the inn, put that on my tab, I'll get it next time I roll through, Right? And then week three, we talked about being afraid of our past. Anybody have any questionable pasts here? 
or not questionable past, but things that they've done in their past that's questionable, there should be more hands, all right? So next week, we'll talk about liars. Um, no, uh, but, but the thing about it is we talked about being afraid of our past, and we realized that our past doesn't have to define us if we allow God to define us. If we lean into his promises, if we lean into who he is, regardless of what we've done, right? Well, now we're on week four, and we're going to talk about fear of our present, all right? A lot of times we don't think about that. A lot of times we don't talk about being afraid of our, our present. We talk about being a little worried about the future, and we talk about being sketched out by our past, but a lot of times we don't focus on the present. Or maybe it's a fear of being present in your present. Does that make sense? Either way, it's something that a lot of people have, but don't realize it or notice it. A fear of being present or a fear of their, uh, of their present. So it's, it's like one of those, um, the present is kind of like one of those, you ever watch those videos where you get those dudes that are dressed up in like the, the ghillie suits that's hiding next to the bush and somebody walks by and they jump out and scare them and they freak out and drop their phone and get mad. <laughs> and they have to bleep things out, or you get some woman that's really mad, starts clipping off her fingernails, taking her hoop earrings out, ready to fight a dude in a bush costume, right? It's, it's like one of those guys. We think it's funny, right? That it's kind of camouflaged, and it's there the whole time. It's kind of hidden in plain sight, right? We think that's funny, but honestly, the stuff that is hidden in plain sight can be the scariest. It can't be. And our presence is just that, Right? Not our presence, our present is just that. I'm going to mess that up like 10 times. <laughs> laugh now, all right? Just laugh now and get it out of the way. So how many of you have ever said, man, I don't know where time's gone. Like things have gone so fast. The, the, the days go by slow, but the years go by fast, that kind of thing. Or it seems like yesterday that the kids were just babies. Or uh, oh, why... What has happened to me in such a short amount of time that I can't walk up a flight of steps without feeling like I'm dying? Or is that just me? Am I the only one? Am I the only one that's, that's getting a little wheezy after a flight of steps, right? That's because time goes by faster than what we think it does. And we all, we all notice that time has gotten away from us. But some of us, we're like jarred by it. Like it rocks us. Whenever we have that moment where we sit back and we're like, where has time gone? Where, what's happened, right? We're jarred by it. And, and a lot of times, it's because we are too busy being worried about everything else that we can't be present. We're not able to, to do and utilize what it is we have in the here and now, right? Because we're worried about everything. We're too busy preparing, we're too busy planning, we're too busy trying to make sure that everything is just right so busy that we actually miss the moments in the present. I'm guilty of this. I'm trying to get better at it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to savor more moments. But honestly, I am prone to lead so, lean so far into the future that I uproot myself from my present. I'm constantly thinking about 10 years out. I'm constantly thinking about five years out. I'm constantly thinking about a year out from now. And I uproot myself from the present, and I hate that. Don't get me wrong. Preparedness is a good thing, all right? Preparedness is not a bad thing. But not if it's all you do is prepare and have no clue what you're preparing for. You're so busy in prepared mode that you're not living in the moment that you're in right now. Then you miss the moments because you're too busy preparing, there's a story in the New Testament. It's actually a, a parable uh, that Jesus tells. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, all right? And so he's talking to a group of people, and he's, he's telling them about the present, really. And he's talking about money. He's talking about finances, if you will, but that's not really what he means. He's talking about what we're doing with our life. It has to do with what we do with what we are given, all right? And I want to try and unpack it a little bit with the mindset that, that he's talking about time and presence. Cool? Can you get with me on that? Are we here? Are we alive? Are we awake? Adam, wake up. Okay. 
So here we go. We're diving in. Matthew 25, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Wait, that's not nice, is it? What are you talking about, five bags to one, two bags to another? That, that's judgmental, isn't it? That's rude. He said, according to their abilities, and then he left on his trip. He didn't care. It was his money. He could do with it what he wanted. He could give it in any matter that he wanted. He could give it in any amount to anybody that he wanted because it was his, right? It's not being judgmental. It's doing what you want with your money. It's doing what you want with what you are able to give, all right? So let's just get that out of the way now. He left on his trip. Then a, a servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more bags. The servant with two bags also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. All right. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them uh, to give an account of uh, how they had used his money. And the servant uh, to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more bags and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had uh, received two bags of silver came forward. Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and, I, and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver, he came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops and, and, and didn't plant um, and gathered crops that I didn't cultivate, why, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Use your head, dummy. So I only gave you one bag of... Anyway, that was paraphrased, sorry. Um, then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance, but for those who do nothing, who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into out, outer darkness where there will be the weeping and gnashing of teeth. A lot of us have heard this story, right? So Jesus, he, he gives three guys uh, a bag of silver or some bags of silver in varying amounts, possibly dependent on character or success or some other uh, storm, uh, uh, sort of mindset. And so we know that everyone doesn't get the same talent or the same amount of talent in this particular situation. I think that, that rings true. Some of us are very talented in certain areas of our lives, and some of us are not. There is a reason that I play the drums. It's because when I sing, I sound like a coyote in a trash compactor. Okay, That's a talent that I've not been gifted with, and so I use the talents that I can. You guys think I play too hard sometimes? Quentin, huh? That's because that's my form of worship. Thank you very much. <laughs> but there, we're not all given the same talents in the same amounts. But what they were given was time, resources, and opportunity, right? Which is generous. So I can't sing. I can drum a little. There are a lot of things that I can't do. You don't want me to do your taxes. You don't want me to do anything administrative. It's terrible. Okay? Those are things that I can't do, right? Yeah, he knows. He knows. My people know that I am administratively inept. Okay? But 
what we are given is time, resources, and opportunity from a generous God. We're given the same thing. And I want us to think about this, right? God, God found it fit for you to be born in this time in history, in this country. Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound like a lot, right? That doesn't sound like much until you think about the fact that we are in America in the most technologically advanced point that the world has ever been in. Unless you believe in aliens, then that's a whole other conversation, right? Um, I, I, I've, I've been to third world countries. I've been to a couple of them. It's not the same as it is here. They don't, they don't have the same opportunities there that we have here. Their every day would be extreme discomfort for us. I'll tell you that much, right? But God, for some reason, found it fit for you to be born now and here. Because over there, they're in, they're in survival mode. We're not in survival mode. I don't care how frustrated you are with the, with the politics and all the, all the craziness that's going on in our nation right now. You are still better resourced and better positioned than most people in this world. Most. A capital most. Like almost everybody in this world. And we see this in the guys that, that Jesus gives the money to, right? Which leads me to my first point. Ready, aim, fire. Because the verbiage in this passage is something that we don't want to overlook, right? The man with, with five bags of silver, he began investing, right? He started something. He did something. The man with two bags of silver, the words, or, or the passage says, went to work. Went to work is almost an insult. Nowadays, right? <laughs> now, I don't think they were like, oh, I heard of this new thing called Bitcoin, so I'm just going to throw it all in that, right? <laughs> see, see what happens. No, they were aware. They were purposeful. And not only were they aware and purposeful, but then they pulled the trigger on it, right? They put that money somewhere. They did something with that money. I'm sure they knew and understand the market around them. They took some time to study how they would invest or make money work for them. The man with five bags, he invested. So he literally made the money work for him. Right? That's what you do when you invest. You let the money work for you. But imagine how hard it would be to pull the trigger on letting go of five bags of silver. That's a lot of money. I tried to figure out how much it was. But remember that administratively inept thing? No, I'm just kidding. Theologians are, are they're, they're, very, um, they're very divided on this. It could be anywhere from uh, $40,000 to $4 million, which is kind of a big gap, so I didn't want to quote any um, uh, any numbers there, any solid numbers, because those numbers ain't solid. But still, that's a lot. You think about 40 grand. Hand you 40 grand right now. You throwing it in Bitcoin? No? You, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, let's talk, buddy. Um, are you digging a hole and burying it in the ground? What are you doing with it? Especially knowing that they, that the money wasn't yours to begin with. But this man, he's aware, and he's purposeful, and he pulls the trigger, right? The man with two bags, it says he goes to work and doubles his money. It says, it says later he invests, but, it, but at the beginning, there's a difference between the guy with five and the guy with two. So this guy, he goes to work and doubles his money, right? It says that he goes to work. Chances are he already had a gift, or a job, or something that he was good at, or a passion, or something that he believed in. He leveraged what he already knew he could do. So he worked smart, and he worked hard for an outcome that pleased the master. Right? So let's, let's stop for a second and look at what we've been given. I want you to take a, 
a mental and emotional look at your life. What bag of talents has he dropped into your lap and said, do something? And how are we interacting with that? How are we either making that work for us or working smart and hard for it in order to please the master? What are we doing to add value to what we've been gifted by God? Because when it's time to settle accounts, what are we going to say? Well, you didn't give me enough. Or all I could do was get by. Or all I got was one bag of silver. Take a look at your life. Take a second and, 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 and savor and enjoy that. What you've been given, what you've been gifted Enjoy that. Hey, I like stuff. I don't have enough stuff. I would like more stuff. I'm just going to go out and admit it. I like cars. Like I sit and watch YouTube videos on cars that I will never be able to own. I like shoes. I sit and watch YouTube videos on shoes that I will never be able to own. Okay? It's ridiculous. I like houses. I have a house. I don't need another house. I just, I just tore the floor out of a house on wheels yesterday with Quentin. I got two houses. One is gutted and is on wheels. Can't get it started. I don't know why I'm looking at houses on YouTube. I don't need another freaking house. For real. But the fact that I don't have the stuff that I like doesn't keep me from savoring the stuff that I have. So I take the moments. Heck, I even take the moments that I have and make something more valuable out of those moments. Now, you guys know that, I, that I'm a little fan of Disney World, right? Just a little bit, not a whole lot. But this is why, because it's a place where my family and I are able to make moments that we savor. It's this thing that we go back to where I see my boys try something new and then we speak into that, where we stand in a line, a two and a half hour line, all right? And can still have a conversation about excellence of the decorations around us in a two and a half hour line for a stupid attraction, right? It's a place for my family to make moments and savor moments. On this last trip, Cooper, he, um, he tried filet mignon for the first time. It's not an everyday thing for the Chandler family. I don't know if you know that, Okay. <laughs> But it was worth the extra $30 for that moment, right? He tried lobster tail. Both of those he liked a lot, which scares me, right? But it was worth the extra money for that moment to save her, right? And it's worth the investment and the work for me. And I believe that it adds value to our life. I believe it adds value to their life. And so that's why I'm so enamored with, with that place because it creates moments and allows us to create moments and adds value to our life. I, I'll take the risk of figuring out how I'm going to help them pay for college for the next two years if that means I get to experience, or the next 10 years if that means I get to experience the next 10 years with them. If that means I get to have moments over the next 10 years with them. If that means I get to create moments with them over the next 10 years, right? Or the other option the other option is just to dig fear holes. Yeah, that's a thing, I think. I don't know. Just kind of came up with it. Dig fear holes. The third guy, his reaction is fear to what he's been given, right? I don't know if he's afraid of losing it, or afraid of wasting it, or, or just, just a, uh, maybe he's just a nervous character. I don't know. So he digs a hole and buries the money. He allows his fear to get the best of him. And, and this keeps him from doing the task at hand. Has anybody in here been crippled by fear to the point where it keeps them from doing the task at hand? From accomplishing what it is that they set out to accomplish? Because I've been there. His task was utilizing the talents that the master gave him and add value to it right? 
Mind you, investing and, 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 and works still, uh, mind you, he invests. Bit, <laughs> sorry, I got myself messed up. Anyways, he invests and he works, mind you, just in the wrong ways. He invests, he invests the money into the ground, right? He works. Anybody here ever dug a ditch, dug a hole? That's work, right? So he does exactly what the other two guys do. He just does it in the wrong fashion, in the wrong way. He invests in the ground, he works to dig holes. And this, this, this brings him maybe a peace of mind for a little bit but with no added value, with no added value. That's because he is thinking about the future. What happens in the future? Well, the master comes back, right? He's thinking about the future without any thought of the present. What was the present? What am I supposed to be doing with this? What am I supposed to be doing with what he's given me, with what he's gifted me, right? Right? He has, he has developed what I call paralysis from analysis, right? He is, he is so in his head about it that he just freezes. He just freezes, right? So he just buries what he's been given. He just digs a hole and puts it there and hopes that somebody doesn't find it. So he just buries it, never actually experiencing the resources that he's been given. Ne never experiencing the resources, the trust, the opportunity that he's been given by the master. He just goes on about his daily life, probably just surviving when he has this opportunity and these resources to thrive. Who wants to just survive when you can thrive? It, it doesn't have to be financial, I'd say it's safe to say that, that Jesus wasn't even talking about money here. He was talking about the gift of our life, the gift of salvation, the gift of hope, the gift of peace, the gift of mercy and grace, everything that he has to offer. It could have, it could have been a way to enrich his family, which I believe Jesus would have found valuable, added value. It would have been a way to, to enrich his circle of friends, which I believe that Jesus would have found value in, he could have used it for anything to add value to his life, but instead he did nothing. He buried it and made excuses. Right? And in the end of the parable, we learn this lesson. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. The two dudes that doubled their money, they were told, well done. You want to know how you get told, well done? Do something, right? There's no well done when you ain't done anything, right? You, you think that'd be good enough, just hearing Jesus say, well done, right? But Jesus always brings more to the table. He says, great job. Keep it and make more. And you get a promotion. Now let's go celebrate together. That's pretty cool. To think about Jesus saying, keep it. Make more. You get a promotion. Let's go celebrate together. That dude can turn water into wine. If anybody can celebrate, right? Imagine taking that moment in. Just imagine taking that moment in. Even more value added to what you've done with what he's gifted you with. Right? Right? This moment where they took what they were given and, and used it and savored it and leveraged it to the point that it gave them new opportunities that they could have had or that they couldn't have had otherwise. Right? They wouldn't have had this had they not invested or went to work for their master, utilizing what it is that he gave them. And, and, the, and the guy who dug the holes, you know what he got? Regret. That's what he has, regret. He has, man, time flies. Man, that time went by way quickly. Way quickly. 
Okay. Um, so, man, I wish I would have. He can't say would have, could have, because he could have. He just didn't, right? He said, man, I wish I would have. He has the remnants of an opportunity lost is what he has. He's spent too much time aiming and never pulled the trigger. Ready, aim, 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 breathe, aim, and never firing. Doesn't do much, does it? Makes you nervous. Might help you concentrate on your breathing a little bit. But you get a headache if you squint with that one eye for too long, right? Ready, aim, aim. Uh, my problem is sometimes I'm ready, fire, aim, which is a problem too. Unless you're rocking a shotgun, then that might work. Anyways, I digress. Um, the decision to bury what God gave us is still a decision. The decision to do nothing is still a decision. You've made that decision, right? The first man had the decision to do something with five bags of silver. He invested it. Second man had a decision to do something with two bags of silver. He put it to work, and he worked hard for it, right? The third man made his decision. Bury it. Do nothing. But that decision will gift you with nothing but regret. That's what you get. Jesus says this. He says, then he ordered, take the money from his, this servant and, and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they've been given, even more will be given and, and, they, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, who do nothing, but bury it, right? Even what they have will be taken away. So what will you do? Right now, in the present, in this moment, with what you've been given. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for for your graciousness, for the fact that you are generous with what you give us. I thank you for life. I thank you for the opportunities that you've given us to live a life of hope, an abundant life. And Father, I pray that we can stop for a second and think on what it is you've given us and figure out how it is we're going to use that to please you and to add value to our life and to the lives of the people around us. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who gives us the opportunity to have life and life abundant. Help us not to bury that. Help us to work. Help us to invest to, and continually reinvest into everything that you give us so that we can have these opportunities with you to celebrate with you, Lord, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's more. Here's a promotion. And let's celebrate together. Lord, we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's celebrate together. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I made I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the 
Thanks y'all so much for being here this Sunday. We'll see you back next week.